So our first speaker is uh, Fiona Foley, and she's speaking to us about contemporary breastplates. So Dr Foley is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Queensland College of Art, Griffith University. Her recent solo exhibitions have been held at the Andrew Baker Gallery in Brisbane and the Ballarat International Photo Biennale uh, this year. Uh, Fiona has just completed her fourth film titled Out of the Sea Like a Cloud. In 2014, she was the recipient of an Australia Council Visual Arts Laureate Award, and she's a regular keynote speaker here and abroad, so we're really thrilled and fortunate to have her with us here today. So please join me in welcoming Fiona. Oh, I pay my respects to the Eora Nation, where we're gathered, and also my Indigenous colleagues in the room who are uh, finishing their PhDs and on that journey, some are on that journey, so um, good to see more coming through the visual arts into academia. So I come from the Wandana clan of the Butchler Nation and I'm going to present a paper effectively about breastplates, but to get there, I, uh, to tell this story, I have to backtrack a little in time. Clouds have played a central role in my recent research, writing and film. Clouds are also featured in the opening of a strange encounter between butchler people and white men through verse. The ship rose up out of the sea like cloud, and it kept near land for three or four days. One day, it came in very close at Takiwuru, and they saw many men walking around on it. They asked each other, who are these strangers, and where are they going? These are two versions of the song in existence Butchler culture is sophisticated and expressed itself in terms of a number of metaphors. This remarkable event recorded in song is little known to the nation we now call Australia. The first preserved Indigenous observation of the British incomers, handed down over generations as oral testimony. The first line, the ship rose up out of the sea like cloud, recounts the billowing sails of the endeavour, bobbing around on a vessel out to sea, our butchler gaze was watching them as they were watching us, which left two substantial shreds of cultural interstices, meaning the space between things or events. How did butchler people feel about this apparition? The song gives us a clue. They were curious and wanted to know more. Who are these strangers and where are they going? The same cannot be said of the British. Inherent in the values of another race pursuing the transit of Venus, the first British visitors, Bruce Pascoe writes, sailed to Australia contemplating what they were about to find. An innate superiority was the prism through which their new world was seen. Thus, before the British even arrived in Australia, there were pre-existing principles upon which the people they encountered on arrival would be understood. Principles that subjugated them as, in, as inherently inferior. With the endeavour passing by this volcanic headland on the 20th of May, 1770, the sovereign Aboriginal gaze had been observing them for days and indeed weeks. These events are marked by British arrogance to name sites that already had names. The butchler name for this place is Takiwuru. Cook went on to also name Sandy Cape and Breaksea Spit. The space between things or the events became an exercise 
in scientific racism. The volcanic outcrop of rock on Gari is a key into colonial thinking about race and science. Encountering Aboriginal sovereign nations up and down the east coast of Australia, the British saw and remarked upon many Aboriginal clan groups and campfires. The act of mapping, discovery, and European possession unfolded with the Butchler people at the very centre of this racialisation unfolding in real time. As Jody A. Bird identifies in her publication, The Transit of Empire, quote, global systems that secure white dominance through time, property, and notions of self played out at Takiwuru. More importantly, at the site of the first Aboriginals, Captain James Cook and Sir Joseph Banks were engaged in a discussion about their skin colour and hair texture to try and define this new race of humans. Not wanting to classify them as Negroes, they referred to them as Indian at different stages due to their hair, not being like wool or woolly. The evidence is writ large and left behind by Cook for all to witness when he renamed the spot Indian Head. The rocky outcrop did not look like an Indian's profile, but was named in observance of the Butchler people, amassed in number on top. It no longer retains its Butchler name with Queensland Parks and Wildlife Services signage to the entry points of the headland, stamping their cultural dominance over this tract of land. Like so many stories about our island, they are nearly all shrouded in layers of silence. Just like Cook's well-versed racial hierarchical practices, naming is central to the transaction between object and the native receiver of breastplates. Usually personalised with a corresponding place name and a descriptor of the man or woman is often engraved into the brass. Jacqueline Troy identifies an Aboriginal person wearing a Georgette was, certainly from the colonialist point of view, considered to be a leader within the Aboriginal community. To bestow this object was to select the leader of an Aboriginal sovereign nation. Aboriginal people do not rule in the Western sense, but govern through consensus. Breastplates and their codification are problematic objects for this very reason. The bestowing of leadership is still problematic in this country and has become the precursor of the Australian media to anoint our national Aboriginal leadership when it does not culturally exist. A number of years ago, I first encountered the performance by Dr. Michael Mell from Papua New Guinea. I was made aware of racial naming and the act of ceremony at the National Museum of Australia. He had made a series of breastplates from cardboard and during his performance took them off one by one from around his neck and gave them to individuals who largely comprised of a white audience. They were inscribed with an English word used to denigrate native people. In this one performance, Dr. Mel had shifted the racial dynamic and placed the emphasis back on the curious white interloper it was a powerful exchange to name white people, for example, as dirty, savages, and lazy. Not until recently have I come across five breastplates held in the Museum of Queensland collection from my traditional country. They were a part of the jigsaw I never thought to look for until mentioned by my cousin 
and I'm talking about two weeks ago. I have used breastplates in my own work, usually in photographic series, and more recently, a wall installation. I cannot definitively explain why I went in this direction, but it's been a gradual process over many years. The first being made in 2010 for the series Bearing Witness, that's the photographic series, inscribed with a quote by Greek philosopher Sophocles, ignorant men don't know what good they hold in their hands until they've flung it away. The quote for me represented indigenous knowledges that had been lost by the rapid destruction of traditional societies on the east coast of Australia by the colonials. While doing my PhD research, I came across a number of phrases that stayed with me and ended up forming part of my ex exegesis exhibition. So my PhD was on a piece of legislation titled the Aboriginal Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act 1897. Up until that point of time, opium was legal in the state of Queensland and after that legislation was introduced, uh, Archibald Meston introduced 33 clauses in that particular legislation that started to isolate Aboriginal people on Fraser Island in a mission, and it was to bring all the opium-affected Aboriginals to that part of Queensland to control their addiction. And one of those other gems that I found was in relation to a 1851 massacre that had taken place over 11 days on Fraser Island. And the lieutenant in charge of that particular massacre with the native mounted police referred to Butchler people on the island as the charcoals of Fraser Island. And that was one little phrase that I couldn't let go of and I thought I had to use that in a breastplate. This is a derogatory term used to describe Aboriginal women. Um, I've done bodies of work around this over many, many years. And um, it was, you know, Europeans would go out hunting at night for Aboriginal women to rape them. So that, to put it bluntly, that's also a part of our interaction of races between Europeans and Aboriginals. So um, my talk's going to end quite shortly, actually. <laughs> so we get a bit more of a chance to sort of ask questions. So the horror has a face branding that you saw in conjunction with this particular um, conference comes from this body of work uh, that I used, that I created in 2017 as a part of my PhD research. So on this particular breastplate, it just says Butchler Warrior. This person here, his name's Joe Gaylor, and he is Butchler. So I'm just going to end on this slide here. As time moves on, I've become aware of other Aboriginal artists making breastplates, like the community in Ballarat, Victoria. I personally invited members of the Picture Making Fellows to exhibit their work alongside mine um, for the Ballarat International Photo Biennale, and here's the catalogue the show's currently on. There's three essays in this catalogue, and that show will come to the National Arts School in January next year as a part of the Sydney Festival, so I'm pretty proud about that. Um, so other people making breastplates are great surprises to me and I ended up buying one who I didn't know was made by a six-year-old boy and inscribed, you can see in the writing here, is black spirit and I think black spirit, that's what makes us unique as Aboriginal artists so I want to end on a high.